that uh, last pat or that third verse in there. Somebody open up, open up that song again, where it talked about the star. Okay, I was thinking about that, and here you have, born in Bethlehem, the light of the world. Okay, the sun. Boy, I like this. I'm, I'm just kind of thinking about this. Do you know, according to the Bible, the morning has a womb? Okay, you, read, you look up the word womb, King James Bible, and you'll see that the morning has a womb. And so here's Christ, when the sun rises, he's the light of the world. That's him being born. And all of the angelic host are out at night shining their light but their light isn't good enough. The world needs a greater light. So when the sun is born, Christ being born in Bethlehem, the light of the world, when the sun comes up, those lesser lights, they all bow and they yield themselves to the light of the world. That's why you don't see the moon and the stars anymore. Somebody send me a Okay, I got you. So anyway, where, what does that verse say? That third, I think it's the third verse. There's, a, there's like eight verses to Silent Night, Holy Night. But. Guiding Star. Okay, now stop right here. Guiding Star, lend thy light. Is that biblical, that Jesus is a star? Yes, he's the star of Jacob. Okay, he is the bright and morning star and um I, I just love that because you know for years people didn't understand the nature of the heavens that god made and i remember learning in school that the sun was a star just like all of the other stars that are out there and i'm going wow i didn't ever think about that but science was only catching up to what the Bible already declared, that Jesus, of course, is the sun, but he's also a star. The sun is actually a star, and the Bible declares it. If you think about it that way, the Bible said it before man ever figured it out. Amos chapter 5, turn there. Amos chapter 5. Um, Ephesians 6, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers, this is what we're talking about, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. And we've, we've talked about the stars and the heavens and things like that. In Sunday school, we've been talking about the third heaven. And um, in this particular study, we're studying devils. Devils are, if you remember, devils are evil angels. Uh, you could say that they are fallen angels. Devils are little g gods. I believe that every statue, every idol, has a spirit associated with it. I do. I think there is a little g god with that idol. And um, so that kind of tells you, you go into a church and they got statues of Jesus and Mary and Joseph and Paul and Peter. I think there's devils. I think there's spirits attached to that. God told us not to do it. I don't see any. But now I'm dizzy. So we are wrestling against. Uh, the rulers of the darkness of this world. And how do you defeat darkness? You turn the light on. Israel has a problem. To this day, they have a problem. Amos chapter 5, verse 21. God said, I hate, I despise your feast days. And I will not smell in your solemn assemblies. And what does he mean by that? I will not smell in your solemn assemblies. What does he mean by that? Huh? Okay, they would burn incense. Okay, they would burn incense. But also they would burn a sacrifice. 
and it smelled like animals, smelled like steak. It smelled like barbecue is what it smelled like, okay? And they were doing that. They were having feast days. They were making sacrifices. They were lighting incense. And God said, I'm not going to smell it. Meaning, I'm not going to, you know, you pass by a steakhouse, you know you've just driven by a steakhouse, don't you? Or a Chinese buffet. Can, oh, I used to, could not pass them up. Okay? But God said, I won't smell them. I'm not going to derive pleasure from your feast days. And here you have the Jews and you have all the Hebrew roots people who are telling everybody, we keep the feast days, we keep the feast days. And God says, I hate, I despise your feast days. I'm not in them. Verse 22, though you offer me burnt offerings and your meat offerings, I will not accept them. Neither will I regard the peace offerings of your fat beasts. Take thou away from me the noise of thy songs. That's uh, all that praise and worship, hill song stuff. They're worshiping with their flesh. They're worshiping with the sound of their instruments. We, had, we were listening to uh, internet radio, had Christmas songs going, and they were playing a song from Hillsong, and they were singing uh, two lines from the song Amazing Grace. They had given it different music. And after the 25th time they sang those, those two lines, I said, i got to cut this off. I'm, I'm sick of this. It was just repetitive over and over and over and over again. And God, Jesus said, don't do that. So he said, take thou away from me the noise of thy songs, for I will not hear the melody of thy viols. Those were stringed, and that's what the word violin or vi viola comes from. They were stringed instruments. Sometimes they were plucked, sometimes they were played with a bow. But let judgment run down as waters. And righteousness as a mighty stream. Have ye offered unto me sacrifices and offerings in the wilderness forty years, O house of Israel? But ye have borne, watch this, ye have borne the tabernacle of your Moloch and Chion, your images, the star of your God. They were worshiping. Now, think about it. What is the symbol for the nation of Israel? The star. They call it the Star of David. I'm not aware of any place in Scripture where David was attached to a star or there was a star in reference to him or a symbol of a star in reference to David. Not one. So, I mean, people use that and they say, I support Israel and things like that, and I'm fine with that. I don't curse Israel. I don't... They're God's people and I'm not going to curse them. But they're not serving the Jehovah God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They are still serving Moloch, the star of your God, which is a ruler of the darkness of this world. And because they serve this little G, God, this star, that means that they are in darkness. And stars put out very little light. Can you read by starlight? You cannot read, you cannot see, you cannot, all of that symbolism is packed into this. When they are rulers of the darkness of this world, that means that anybody who's been blinded and cannot see the truth, that's who they're under. That's what spirit is ruling over them, a ruler of the darkness this world and he said the star of your God which you made to yourselves therefore will I cause you to go into captivity beyond Damascus saith the Lord whose name is the God of hosts the God and the host are what the army but they are the angels of heaven all of those stars all of those planets up there everything up there is the host of God he controls them he rules them he is in charge of them they do what he says for them to do now turn to uh, Acts chapter 7 Stephen man I'll tell you what I am not a preacher Stephen was a preacher I God would have to really come on me in power and I believe that he would, but God would have to really come on me in power to say what Stephen said to the elders of Israel, the Sanhedrin. 
He, remember, Stephen was not an apostle. He was not a pastor or a bishop. What was he? He was a deacon, John. And here he was out preaching the gospel. And the Jewish elders hated him for it, and they brought him in. And Steve, you know what, I, you know what I'm sick of hearing from people? I'm not, I'm not talking about religion. It's not a religion. That's a lie. When you are trying to get people to be awakened to God, that's religion. Oh, it's not religion, it's relationship. That is a coward's way of talking about God. A coward's way. So, um, Stephen was before the Sanhedrin and he was laying it on them. All, he went to all the Old Testament and he showed them, these were your forefathers, this is how they rejected the God that loved them, that carried them across the Red Sea, that they met at Mount Sinai, that fed them 40 years in the wilderness. God did all these great things for your forefathers and you hated him and you still hate him to this day. You hate Jesus. So Acts chapter 7, verse 42. Stephen says, Then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven. Watch this now. Why is it that they ended up worshiping stars? God turned them over to it. You ought to get on your face before God one day alone and say, God, please. Whatever comes across the internet, don't turn me over to worship false gods. Do not turn me over to the spirit of Antichrist. Do not turn me over to air. I have prayed that. You, I had, don't know how many times I've prayed that. God, please don't turn me over to lie. Please don't do that. And it really gets me. I mean, I get bothered when I see people turn away from the truth. It bothers me. But God turns people over. Why? They didn't want to hear it. So, as it is written in the book of prophets, O ye house of Israel, have ye offered to me slain beasts and sacrifices by the space of 40 years? He's quoting Amos. In the wilderness, yea, you took up the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of your god Remphan. Now, Chiun then is Remphan. And Remphan is Chiun. But according to the, the various mythologies, both of these are Saturn, Sterling. We were watching a video in my office earlier about the, the various photographs we have of the different planets. Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn with its rings, which I think is Ezekiel 1. But anyway, they were worshiping Saturn. And I don't, have a, I don't have a picture of it here, but I've presented this many times. Science has discovered, and it's the weirdest thing I've ever seen in my life. There is a clear, a visible and clear hexagon cloud formation on the North Pole of Saturn. We didn't know that until we sent that Voyager there deal, pass by them, take pictures, and now we see this hexagon, this very visible, clear cloud formation clouds making whatever degree angle that is for to make a hexagon it's a swirling hexagon at the north pole of saturn it's been there probably since the creation and it just happens to match the star of david that's on their flag dun, dun, dun. and look at this Look at it. Look how stephen presented this the star of your god figures which ye made to worship them God said, I didn't draw that, you did. And I will carry you away beyond Babylon. God turned them over to worship this false god, this Saturn, this evil god. And because of that, he's going to use that to carry them away into captivity. Police officers will do very similar things. If they, if they perceive that there is some sort of drug or alcohol activity in a car, okay, all they have to do is wait for that car to not signal a turn, to not stop at a stop sign, uh, to go beyond the speed limit, to cross the center line, to not have seat belts on, to have the license plate not right or gone or whatever. All they need is a reason to pull them over. And now once they smell the, al the alcohol or the marijuana, now they, have, now they can be taken into captivity. And that's exactly what God did here. He turned them over to worship that. And because of that, he then pulled them into Babylon. 
And they are still spiritually in Babylon to this day. Now turn to um, 2 Kings chapter 17. What would be easier if I put this on the screen for you, wouldn't it? How come I got to do all the work? I don't mind. Man, I love this book. I love getting into it. I love studying it, figuring th- and putting things together. And the Bible just makes sense once you know it. Amen. Second Kings chapter 17, verse 16. The prophet said they left all the commandments of the Lord their God and made them molten images, even two calves. This is now when the, when the kingdom split. And you had the ten tribes go to the north. You had Judah and Benjamin to the south. God divided that nation. That was the sword of David that never departed from his house. God allowed it to be okay during the life of Solomon. But as soon as Solomon died, God divided the kingdom. Jeroboam, I think, no. uh, Yeah, Jeroboam to the north, Rehoboam to the south. So in Jeroboam, they they were in, um, where was it? Can't remember. Who was the woman at the well? Jesus. Anyway. They made, they made a new capital instead of Jerusalem, and then they built a temple there. And because they didn't have Ark of the Covenant, they put two golden calves in there to worship. And then they made a grove, and then, according to verse 16, they worshiped all the host of heaven and served Baal. So Baal is linked in with these stars, these stars. Uh, rulers of the darkness of the world. Baal is linked into them. Wherever worship is to worship them, Baal is right there. I believe Baal to be the Old Testament Antichrist, the opposite of the Lord Jesus, all right? And they caused their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire and use divination and enchantments and sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. When you are worshiping these angels, these gods, when you're, when you're under the spell... When you are under the spell, the guy I interviewed, Adam, said that those that he associated with in the flat earth movement, he said, I believe they were under a spell, because I was. And he said when he came out, he just felt like that spell had been broken in his life. But Israel now is under a spell to do these enchantments, make their sons and daughters pass through the fire, sell themselves to do evil. That's what these spirits will cause people to do. Sell out to these gods. Whatever these gods demand, that's what they have to give. Uh, Turn to 1 Kings 22. 1 Kings 22. Eight seconds. Seven. I'm already there. 1 Kings chapter 22, verse 19. And he said, Hear thou therefore the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven standing by him on his right hand and on his left. Think about Jesus. Jesus has his sheep and his goats. Sheep on his right hand, goats on his left. And see, this is the story about Ahab's going to go into battle the next day. And the king of Judah says, how can, I, I'll, I'll hook in with you, fight with you, but I, w- I want some assurance from God that you're going to win this thing. And Ahab said, oh, all of my 400 men have told me that yes, they even made horns of iron and said, with these horns, you're going to push your enemies back. And I think it was Jehoshaphat who said, is there not somebody else that we can, he did not trust that. Ahab said, I got Micaiah. But I don't like him. He don't tell me what I want to hear. That is your modern church member. Tell me what I want to hear. Don't tell me what I don't want to hear. And if you say that, we're either going to throw you out or we're going to leave and we're going to go to another church that will. So, verse 20, And the Lord said, Who shall persuade Ahab that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? One said on this matter and the other said on that matter. There came forth a spirit and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. And the Lord said unto him, wherewith? And he said, I will go forth, and I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all of his prophets. And he said, thou shalt persuade him and prevail also. Go forth and do so. But it was was the rulers of the darkness of this world, one of those evil angels, 
presented himself to God and said, God, I know how to get Ahab to get in that battle. How are you going to do it? I'm going to be in the mouth of all 400 of those prophets. A spirit can do that. One spirit can do that. And I will cause them to say, God's going to bless you. You're going to come out with the victory. And that sounds exactly like that Joel Osteen crowd and all these other churches and these big money pastors telling everybody, oh, you're a victorious. Oh, you're a winner. Oh, you're a champion. Oh, God is in your favor. Oh, God loves you. And you're just going to prevail in everything. In fact, there's probably a check coming to you in the mail right now. If you'll just hand over, your, if you'll sow your seed of $1,000, I guarantee you, God's going to give you more plenty or something like that. They probably say it a little bit better than I said it. But what that is, is the rulers of the darkness of this world keeping their people in darkness. They don't want them in the light. Uh, let's see here. Where can I have you go? Turn to the book of Job. Mm, 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 mm. Listen to this now. This, these verses here that I'm going to read to you, you're going to see it in your Bible. They are how darkness works. If these devils rule over darkness this is how they do it this is how they get people this is how they work at them job 38 verse 1 then the lord answered job out of the whirlwind i told you to go to psalms right i was just okay job 38 8 7 6 5 4 3 2 1 job 38 1 then the lord answered job out of the whirlwind and said watch this now who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? People are kept or are led into darkness by words. Huh? Dark counsel will bring darkness to people's lives. So the cults, Mormons, Jehovah's Witness, all these other cults that are trying to bring in membership. What they're doing is with their words, they are darkening their counsel. And when people believe their words, they abide in darkness. They live in darkness. And darkness hates the light. Amen? Amen? Do you remember the days when you didn't want to get up on Sunday and go to church? That was not your routine. You had devils, or maybe you just one, that was keeping you, keep you in bed, keep you up all night Saturday night. Dancing, drinking, doping, doing all that stuff on Friday, Saturday night. Because you didn't have to get up and go to work Sunday. You could lay up in bed all day Sunday while God's people went to the church and prayed for you. There were spirits that were keeping you in darkness at that time. Now, Psalm 35. 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2. Here we go. Psalm 35, verse 3. Draw out also the spear and stop the way against them that persecute me, saying to my soul, I am thy salvation. Watch this. Let them be confounded and put to shame that seek after my soul. Let them be turned back and brought to confusion that devise my hurt. Let them be as chaff before the wind and let the angel of the Lord chase them. Watch this. Let their way be what? Dark and slippery. That's my biggest fear now. Walking on black ice. I don't want to say it too fast because then it says, I sound like I hate black guys. I hate black ice. No, black ice. Dark, you can't see it. Frost on the porch steps. And you step on them. I did. And what I, I 
what had happened was I was going up the steps. This was a few weeks ago, several weeks ago. And I thought, man, this porch is slippery. Here comes Lindsay and the kids. So I went and grabbed some salt. And I was going to going to go back down the steps to get the salt. And the third step, I thought I was good. I had a hand on the rail. And my foot just went right out from underneath me. And I felt something pop right here. And that still hurts. I don't know what I did, but something popped in here. Okay? That's the slippery way in the darkness. But those, and I, I'm going to tell you what, I, you pray for Adam. The man that I interviewed. The things that they have thrown out at him are vile. They're very vile. They intend to do great harm to him because he dared challenge their theories. That's all he did. And instead of saying, we have, here's the Bible verses that prove that we're right, they go after the man and the things that they're saying about him, God help him. You know what he said to me? He said, I'm going to deal with it head on. And I, I knew that this would happen. But it's, and it's that way in every, whenever you have those who persecute you, those who despise you, those who go against you because of what you believe. To them, you're dangerous because of what you believe. There are people in Washington, D.C. that actually believe that Bible-believing Christians are dangerous to this country. And at some point, when they get their power back, it wouldn't surprise me a bit for them to come out. Okay? So that's, that's the kind of people you're dealing with when you're dealing with those that are in darkness. Uh, let's look at Psalm 69. That shouldn't be too hard to find. Psalm 69. Look what they did to Jesus. Psalm 69 is the prophecy of the cross. Psalm 69, verse 21. They gave me also gall for my meat. And in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. That's a prophecy. That was written a thousand years before Christ. How did they know, Gloria? How did they know? How did this man know that a thousand years later they were going to give Jesus vinegar to drink while he was on the cross? God told him. And he wrote it down. Let their, watch this, let their table become a snare before them, and that which should have been for their welfare, welfare, let it become a trap. Watch this, let their eyes be darkened that they see not. Make their loins continually to shake. Pour out thine indignation upon them, and let thy wrathful anger take hold of them. There's a, there's a story of this, there's a picture of this in your Bible. In Acts chapter 13, when Saul all of a sudden becomes Paul, He's trying to witness to a man named Sergius Paulus, who is a deputy of this area. He's trying to witness to him, telling him about Jesus, and he's listening to him. But there is a sorcerer named Elimus who is coming out after him, and he's trying to pervert what Paul is saying. Paul confronted him. Paul, listen, Paul's, Paul's got the light, amen? And he sees darkness trying to take over this man's life, and Paul loves this man enough to try to tell him about Jesus. And here is Elimus the sorcerer, Trying to, trying to pervert what Paul's doing and bring darkness to this man. And Paul said, you child of the devil. And Paul cursed him and he walked into, he lost his sight right then and there. I'll tell you this, it's a known fact. I can't remember, I think it's the New American Standard Bible. At least one of the translators of that perverted version went blind after translating that Bible. Let their eyes be darkened. That what that mean, are you guys worried about that little wasp? Huh? The shadow, huh? Scares you. Listen, don't worry about that. Amen? Uh, Psalm 82, let me read this real quick. Deliver the poor and needy, rid them out of the hand of the wicked. They know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. See what your Bible says, John? It says the earth has a course. Do you believe the Bible? Amen. Turn to 
Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Write that verse down. Keep, memorize that. Don't forget it. Huh? Mm-mm-mm. world has a course. Romans chapter 1, verse 21, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2. Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful. My brothers and sisters, get out on your knees every now and then. Tell God thank you. Tell Him thank you. You've got the truth. You've got the word of God. You've got grace manifested in your life. You've got mercy on you. Tell God thank you for what, you, for what he's done. They glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Now, this is where the cults step in. The cults can only work in a darkened heart. How does a heart Matthew, how does a heart get dark? Caleb? Huh? Blood flow? That's not bad. Yeah. Yes, Rose. Sin. Listen to her. Sin darkens the heart of man. The absence of light the word of God darkens the heart of man. The cults can never persuade someone who has light in their heart. Never do it. If you've got this Bible, you know the word of God. You, may, you don't have to have it all memorized. You don't have to understand every word, every phrase, every paragraph. But you believe it as the word of God. There's light in your heart and darkness cannot comprehend that. Darkness cannot invade that space. So you're not in danger. But the people who absent themselves from the light, the word of God, darkness creeps in and that's where the cults do their work. Because they have the rulers of that darkness, of this world, every false cult, every false doctrine, every strange way, every ritual, everything like that is because of a darkened heart. Someone who's absent the word of God in their life. Does that make sense? No cult, no cult can teach the whole counsel of God from a King James Bible and maintain their doctrine. I'll give you an example. Jehovah's Witness do not believe in the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. 1 John 5, 7 then destroys their doctrine. Amen? Okay? The Jehovah's Witness say Jesus was a created angel and given the title of the Son of God, but he's not really God. John chapter 1, verse 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That destroys their doctrine, so they had to change it by adding an A to it. Uh, you, listen, you mark it down. Every false cult and every other gospel, they will always destroy the King James Bible in order to teach their doctrine. The guy told me that the reason why a lot of those big flat earth people are able to say what they say and they, and they say, we, you know, the Bible says so, is that they have all been told and they believe that even the King James Bible has been corrupted by various ways, including the stupid Mandela effect. Dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. But their foolish heart is darkened. Why? Because they're absent the light. Watch this, verse 22, professing themselves to, be, to become wise, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like the corruptible man and the birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Why? It's because rulers of the darkness of this world has dictated that to them that that's what God is. Wherefore, verse 24, watch this now. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own what? Hearts. To dishonor their own bodies 
between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And he's saying, the source, sodomy is not the disease. The disease is darkness of the heart. Sodomy is the symptom or the result of that disease. Does that make sense to everybody? Having these false ideas and these false cultist doctrines in their mind is not the disease. It's the symptom. The, the disease itself is a darkened heart. Um, and this is why God gives people up to vile affections. Don't ever say that you're not capable of being turned into these vile affections if you allow your heart to be darkened by your sin and by your disbelief and dishonoring of the Word of God. Okay? Don't ever say, I would never do that. It's in the heart of man. Amen? Let's move on. Ephesians chapter 4. <clears throat> verse 17 this I say therefore Ephesians 4 17 this I say therefore and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind having the understanding darkened so when their understanding is darkened they have spirits that rule over them being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them Ignorance can either be because they haven't been told or they were told and didn't believe it anyway. That's ignorance. Because of the blindness of their what? Not their eyes. Their heart. How is it that you can show people something and some people say, I'm convinced, and others looking at the same thing say, I don't see any, I don't see the proof. I don't see anything there. How is it that two people or two groups of people can look at the same thing, one gets it, and others don't get it? How is that? It's not their eyes that are blinded, it's their heart that's blinded. And that's sad. That's sad. Because I know people and you know people who've been blinded in their heart in various ways. Who being past feeling have given, uh, where did I, yeah. Verse 18, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to, unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. I'm telling you, what, here's what God is saying. Here's what God is saying. Those who have turned their heart dark by alienating themselves from the light of God, they will turn into lasciviousness. It's automatic. You may never see it, but I think at some point it gets manifested because as people turn darker and darker and turn themselves over to more and more lasciviousness, they, don't, they get to where they don't hide it anymore. Guys, I know, pastors, I know, who show up at a church meeting with their boyfriend. A pastor that I know that at one time I was considering being an associate to him. Went off, came back, his wife divorced him, he's got a boyfriend now. Listen, I'm telling you, when that heart is dark, they will turn over to lasciviousness. Automatic. So that's kind of, I guess, the sign. The fruit, as it were of who they really are, what they really believe. That's scary. That's very scary. 
Ephesians chapter 5, verse 6. Here it is again. Here's how darkness comes in. Young people, listen to this. Okay? Your mom and daddy is telling you, don't listen to this kind of music. Don't listen to that kind of music. Don't watch that show on TV. Don't watch these people on YouTube. Don't watch this on Netflix. They're telling you these things. Why? Because they know there's vain words in them, and they know that the whole point is to try to alienate people away from God. Am I right? That same pastor that showed up with a boyfriend, Sterling, I don't know if you remember this, but we were sent over to paint. He had just become the pastor of this one church. We were sent over there to paint the parsonage. They had already moved into it, and they wanted it repainted, so they sent us into this years ago, back when I was painting houses. And in their teenage daughter's bedroom was all the rock and roll posters of the rock and roll stars half naked. That pastor's daughter. And I'm just looking at this, I'm going, are you kidding me? But I never, I never dreamed that this man would end up being a sodomite. Let no man, Ephesians 5, 6, let no man deceive you with what kind of words? Vain words. For because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them, for ye were sometimes darkness. Raise your hand. We used to be in darkness, didn't we? But now are ye light in the Lord. He didn't say you are, part, you are receiving the light. He said you're light. When people see us, guys, they're supposed to see light, not darkness. But now are ye light in the Lord, walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. It is our responsibility that when we see unfruitful works of darkness, it is our responsibility if we're brought into the city. Now, don't, I don't think you ought to just go around injecting yourself in everybody's life. But if God brings you the situation, turn the light on. Turn the light on. Well, they'll hate me for that. Have no fellowship for the unfruitful works of darkness. Rather, reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done to them in secret. This Bible's right. There's stuff I won't even talk about. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light, for whatsoever doth make manifest is light. There are people in darkness everywhere. And the internet has brought massive darkness to people everywhere. And it has created loads of confusion there i read an article the other day it was an online article and it was about how people end up believing the earth is flat but this can be applied to any type of false doctrine when you watch youtube when you first install youtube on your phone or your tablet the app has a setting whereby if you watch one video it automatically selects another video for you to watch that is linked to that first video. And I always turn that off. That annoys me. If I wanted to watch that video, I'll watch that video. Okay, I turn it off. Facebook's the same way. Facebook will set up that anybody who posts a video on Facebook, when you scroll by it, it automatically starts playing. And what it does, it catches you unless you turn that off to not play it automatically. But how people get turned over to all these false doctrines is that autoplay feeds them one video after another, after another, after another, after another. People saying, I didn't realize, but I just spent two solid days almost doing nothing but watching videos on this subject. And now they, all of a sudden, now they believe it. Whatever cultish... 
whatever weird thing it is. Now they believe it because there was a whole string of videos that YouTube selected for them to turn this thing on to them. And then, then they all say, well, the Bible says it that way. But they haven't read the Bible. They watched a YouTube video about the Bible. They have not read the Bible. I'm talking to people who are on the internet. I'm here on the internet with you. And I'm saying to you, as long as the internet and that stuff is going to tell lies, God has put it on us to expose that lie and tell the truth. Now, we are greatly outnumbered. Greatly outnumbered. Just four of the flat earth speakers, just their four YouTube channels, 77 million views of just their four YouTube channels dealing with flat earth, 77 million views. They outnumber us, but I don't care. Numbers don't make them right, okay? Only God's word does. And I'm just saying to you, what I'm telling you is that there are people who have been turned over to darkness. There's a, there's a devil, a ruler of the darkness that is working over them. And the only way to get them out is to pray, God, bail them out. God, I love them. God, I, please deal with them. God, however you got to do it, get them out of that darkness. Let's stand to our feet. I, what I want you to do tonight, you folks here, you folks online, I want you to think of somebody or a group of people. One people, one person, two people that you know, five people that you know, that you know they're in darkness. And in that darkness, they have a ruler over them. And that ruler is not Jesus. And because of that darkness, they are turning over to greed and lasciviousness. And they can't stop. They have, listen, they have no way out of it. They can't stop it. They, in fact, they want it. I mean, who doesn't, right? Who doesn't want greed and lasciviousness? But they get turned over to it. And... They need the precious light of the Word of God or they're going to be in worse darkness. So if you think of one person tonight or five people or ten people that you know that are in darkness, I want you to pray for them. 